We welcome all of you here this bright and glorious Easter morning. It may be bad later in the day, but it's a glorious morning now. We thank you for coming with us. Let's take a moment and let's go to prayer. Father, we enter into your presence. We say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to come before you. Thank you for being with us through the night into the morning and letting us feel your presence and love. Now guide us through this service. We ask your son's name. Amen. I hope you'll join us in singing one verse of Up From the Grave He Arose on this beautiful and glorious Easter morning. situations. Some of us have been closeted more than others, but none of us are feeling at ease in the world today. Father, we just ask now that we could give all of that uneasiness to you, that we could feel your presence, know your love, and know that you are here with us in the midst of whatever is going on around us. We ask you now to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of the things said and done this week that shouldn't have been said and shouldn't have been done. But also forgive us of those things that were left unsaid, those things that were left undone. And mainly, Lord, we left them unsaid and undone because we were too busy, too preoccupied with what we wanted to do at the moment to hear your voice. Forgive us, Lord, when even in the midst of being stuck in our own houses, we still find things to take us away from you. We ask you now to guide us through this service and in the week to come that we may feel your presence and know that you are here with us. For asking your son's name. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 24, which is one of the typical Easter readings. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of our Lord Jesus. When they were wondering about this, Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they took all these things, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them. They told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and he's Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. As I said, this is one of the traditional Easter passages, but this is one that kind of leaves us hanging in the middle. So let's look at it for just a minute together and see if we can find the appropriate ending for this passage. We know that Jesus was killed on Friday when the disciples didn't have much time to properly prepare the body. And it was a sacrilege to have a dead body hanging outside, exposed to the elements. So they had to very quickly take the body down and put it into Joseph's borrowed tomb. 
The Jewish Sabbath would begin at sundown, so very quickly the body was placed in the tomb and had to stay there until Sunday morning. And probably as soon as the sun set on Saturday evening, the women began to get their supplies ready. They needed the spices, the myrrh, the frankincense, the nard. They'd also need a pail of water and some washcloths to wash the dried blood from his hair and his body. Perhaps they were also bringing fresh wrappings for the body. They thought that they had prepared for everything except that giant stone. They knew they couldn't roll that away, but they were hoping that there would be someone there that could help with that and help move the stone. They thought they were prepared, and they would have been if the body of Jesus had been there, but he wasn't there. The stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so Mary ducked down to go inside to the tomb so she could start working on the body. But when she gets in, you know, she's puzzled, she's upset, she's afraid because there is no body. And you can imagine what went to the mind of all the ladies as they all come crowding into the little tomb to look in and verify there's no body in here. So now what? Do they run in fear? Do they go into hiding? Do they go back and tell all the disciples what they've seen? As they're trying to sort all these things out and trying to decide what to do, suddenly two men appear in their presence. Now, it'd be frightening enough if two men just suddenly appeared in the tomb with you, but these were not two ordinary men. Verse 4 says the men were in clothes that gleamed like lightning. The women reacted in fear as we all would. What did they do? In fright, the women bow down their faces to the ground. As they cower in fear and awe, the men speak to them. And the men say, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day be raised again. The only reaction that Luke tells us is the ladies remember his word. <coughs> when they get back into town, they go to tell others what has happened. And do the other disciples, do they shout hallelujah and start shouting, jumping up and down for joy? I mean, after all, this is that for which they've been waiting. But there's no jumping for joy. There's nothing but disbelief. Luke says they did not believe the women because their words seemed as nonsense. Their words seemed as nonsense. There is no body. Two men in shining white clothes suddenly appear in the midst of where we are and tell us that he's been raised just like he said he was. The words did seem as nonsense. But Peter wanted to know for himself. So Peter leaves. He goes out. He wants to check it out for himself. He wants to see where the body is. He leaves the house. He goes running to the tomb. And when he enters the tomb, he sees there is no body. There's nothing but the linen cloths that have been wrapped around the body. So did somebody steal the body? And if they stole it, why didn't they take the cloths? And if they stole the body, why did they take the time to unwrap the body before they took it? Verse 12 says, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. He went away wondering to himself what had happened. That's not much of a joyous, upbeat Easter celebration. He went away wondering to himself what had happened. You see, Peter didn't know the rest of the story. Peter didn't know that Jesus had risen from the dead. Peter didn't know that Jesus' victory over death would give salvation to all of us. He didn't know that this had all been part of God's plan from the very beginning of time. He didn't know that Good Friday was not a mistake. Easter was not something that God had to do to undo what had happened to Jesus. It was not the way God had to fix something that humanity had done wrong. Easter had been part of God's plan from the very beginning. That's why Jesus tells the disciples in verse 46, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and will rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Nothing that happened that day 2,000 years ago was not already planned by God himself. In essence, Easter shows us just how much God loves us. It shows just how much God is willing to sacrifice in order to renew our relationship with him. 
We were created to have fellowship with God, to love and to be loved, but we blew it. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve willfully broke that fellowship and forsook God's love. And ever since that time, God has been putting his plan in motion to bring us back, to show us just how much he loves us. Jesus tells his disciples that his death and resurrection would initiate the preaching of repentance and forgiveness to all nations. We know that his death was for our sins. We should have been the ones who died that day, but instead he assumed our guilt and he paid our penalty. The scars on his hands and feet were evidence of the price he paid. Those should have been our scars. But God loved us so much that he was willing for his son to suffer those scars to save us all from eternal death and from separation from him. Good Friday and Easter are not a mistake. All the events of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection have been foretold by the prophets hundreds of years earlier. It wasn't God trying to wing it and make the best of a situation. It was all part of God's plan of extreme love for each and every one of us. But what's our part in the plan? Verse 47, Jesus tells the disciples that repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. Repentance and forgiveness of sins. If we repent, God forgives. If we recognize that we have sinned and are sorry for that sin, God forgives us. All we have to do is ask him. We don't have to try to clean ourselves up before we go before God. It'd be a good idea if it were possible, but it's not possible. If we could clean ourselves up, well, we wouldn't need a savior in the first place. He accepts us just the way we are, warts and all. He doesn't expect us to do better before we can ask forgiveness. He doesn't expect us to have all the answers or even all the questions. We in all the words, we all know the words of the hymn, just as I am. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And then further down, just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. No pretense on our part, no putting up a front. We admit our failings and we ask God's help. One of my favorite songs says, all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife and he made something beautiful of my life. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be good. All we have to do is be willing, willing to admit our sin, willing to ask his forgiveness, willing to walk in his grace. That's what was made possible at Easter. And that's the rest of the story that Peter didn't know about, know about when he went away wondering to himself what had happened. That's the good news that Christ offers to each and every one of us. Even this year, in the midst of all that's going on around us in the world, we still have the gift that God gave us. We have the gift of eternal life, eternal life that will be in our future and eternal life that is here with us now. We walk daily in the presence of Christ. And all this is possible because of Easter. Yes, Christ the Lord indeed is risen today. Join with me in singing two verses of Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Earth and heaven and chorus say. service. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.